I can only imagine living on property. You don't have the. It's not like you're not there. You are there, and they'll they'll come. You know, <laughs> they'll, they'll they'll introduce. Yeah, you. I've been. You know, like you know, you just answered the door like a normal person. Like if someone knocked at your door, and um, you know, you're in sweatpants, and you just got out of the shower or something, and they're like, "Oh, we were here for a barn tour." And I'm like, uh. <laughs> You're listening to the Venue RX podcast. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Venue RX. On this show, we are passionate about documenting and sharing best practices around owning, operating, and managing world class wedding venues. And we do a number of different styles of show, but today is one of my favorites. We have one of our venue owner series shows. And uh, I absolutely love this because we are talking to real venue owners who are actually running their venues, they're operating them, uh, they are in the field or in the barn or whatever it happens to be, and they are hosting couples. And it's been exciting to connect uh, with all of these folks across the country just to really understand what it takes to run a successful wedding venue. And so today, uh, I am really honored to have Sarah Bolte on the show today. How are you? Good. How are you? I am doing really well. I'm so happy to talk to you. You are uh, the owner of Arlington Acres out in Ohio, correct? Yes. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. Before we jump into the property and uh, you know details of the property and kind of how you got started and all of that, can you give me a little bit of a background on you and you know like how you even got into the industry to begin with? Yeah. Um. I think it's pretty common with with in the wedding industry, but I kind of just stumbled in into it. Um, in 2017, my husband and I got married and um, we both have farm and agricultural backgrounds. And so um, there weren't any wedding venues where I grew up. And so we ended up just cleaning out my parents' barn and having the wedding in their barn. Um, and so then we moved um, after we got married, we moved to Tiffin, which is where we are now um, at, at the Arlington Acres property. And um, we wanted to find a way to save the barn. And um, we couldn't afford to do it on our own. And we were looking, my, hu my husband, um, he, he wanted to come back to the family farm. And um, so we were also looking at ways to diversify the family farm and save the barn and save the family legacy. And um, we were like, well, let's, let's try weddings in the barn. Um, and so he offered it to some coworkers, um, like, Hey, I have this really beautiful old barn. Um, anyone want to give me a reason to clean it out? And, um, lo and behold, someone took us up on it. So, um, and we got the call in January of 2019. Um, and they were looking for a place to have their wedding ceremony and, they needed it for June of 2019. So um, we got right to it. <laughs> um, we, at that point, it was just for a ceremony. So we didn't need bathrooms or anything. It was, and it was for friends. So we weren't charging. And um, so we just kind of did some electrical work, cleaned it out. Um, and then it kind of just spiraled from there um, very, very quickly. We, um, decided to try the knot and wedding wire, see if there was anyone else that would be interested. And um, before I knew it, I had 20 weddings booked for 2020. So. Um, and all that happened in 2019? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it happened pretty fast. It was kind of a happy accident. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, Sarah, I was gonna ask about that. As part of your journey, did you feel like there was always this vision of running a wedding venue or was it like, let's save the barn first. And I was like, Oh, well we could do a couple of weddings. And then it's like, we could do a lot of weddings. And then was there a progression like that? Or was the vision really to start a really profitable wedding venue kind of from day one? It was really to save the barn. Um, it, the, the barn itself is so cool. It was built in the 1880s, um, by a gentleman named Arlington Dunn, which is why we're called Arlington Acres. Um, and Oh, you know, we lived here for a couple of years before we did anything and um, we weren't raising cattle anymore. Um, we used the barn for some pumpkin storage because we're also a pumpkin farm. Um, but it was really just sitting here deteriorating and we weren't going to be able to 
allocate funds to fix it up unless we found it, unless the barn found a way to fund itself. Um, and then, yeah, it, it really started as a way to save the barn. And then um, as we booked a couple weddings, it was like, wow, we can like real maybe actually really do all these things that we dreamed of. Like we'd always talked about um, residing the barn and like, oh, it'd be really cool to add windows and, um, it all just kind of spiraled very quickly. That's incredible. Take me through the rest of your journey. So now you're in 2019, you're booking these weddings. Now 2020 happens and COVID, right? I mean, how did you guys handle that? Yeah, so um, we had 20 weddings booked. Um, we were working through um, like the legal process of making sure that everything with the barn was kosher. Um, and so we actually had all of our materials ordered um, in January of 2020. We were primed to start construction in February, got a little bit of a late start, didn't end up starting until March, um, right when COVID hit. Um, so, I mean, I probably should have been more nervous about it than I, I was, but I was, I think, pretty naive <laughs> about everything. But um, honestly, in hindsight, I'm I'm kind of grateful for um, our start and, and because of COVID, because our, our couples that year gave us a little bit more grace than we were probably warranted. Um, our first wedding was for friends. We only had one in June. We had one in July, one in August, and then we had like a ton booked for the fall. Um, so, um, oh, and Ohio was only moderately shut down. It's not like California. Um, so we were fully shut down for, um, maybe I think maybe two months, um, a, a full two months. And then it was like a slow reopening of there's restrictions on guest count and restrictions on like how far the tables were apart and different things. So um, we, we ended up being under construction most of 2020. Um, so our couples were absolutely amazing dealing with um, being behind on construction. Um, but I think they were just so thankful that they could still have their wedding um, that it, it all kind of, for the most part, worked out. Um, and we only, I think we only lost or rescheduled five weddings. So wow. um, it, was, it was pretty amazing. And then it, it I actually heard another um, venue owner talk about this on one of your other podcasts. But um, because we were new, it we didn't have a ton of weddings booked in 2021. So um, we were able to reschedule people and we were able to accommodate people who were having to reschedule from other venues. And so um, it, it not, not that it was a blessing, COVID was, was by no means a blessing, but it, it worked out um, in, in our favor in a lot of ways. And I'm grateful for it um, and the lessons that we learned through it. Totally. I was going to ask about that. And, and then I want to go back and ask about like permitting and some of the things that we, we skipped over <laughs> through this part so far. But when you think back about COVID and kind of some of those things you went through, I know you talked about maybe a little bit of naivete, right? That almost like you didn't mm -hmm. know, like I should have been more nervous maybe, but you didn't, you weren't, you know, you weren't ner nervous in the, in the moment. Um, but Talk to me for a venue owner who maybe is listening to this right now, scared about a recession or scared about something else. Were there things that you did that helped you as you're running your venue, just kind of stay focused on the venue or on the wedding right in front of you to help execute it and just kind of get through that year when everything was kind of going crazy around you and there wasn't a lot that was certain? I, I think part of it is my husband. My husband is um, absolutely amazing. He helps me do all of the like, he did so much of the construction himself and um, his his family and my family, they really stepped up to the plate and helped us um, and to, so that we could get things done on time. Like we could not have done it without them, but um, he, he was pretty singularly focused on getting construction done. And I was focused on um, communicating with our couples and making sure that, you know, they were up to speed. And um, I think just because there was so much going on, you know, there's so many moving parts. It was really just a matter of what is 
the most urgent thing that has to be done right now. And then, you know, after that's done, what's the next thing that has to be done right now? And so it was really just, you know, prioritizing um, and making that list and just focusing on getting the one thing at a time done that I think allowed us to um, get through. I love that. From what I heard, the two things that kind of helped you were your community and like the people that were in your close circle. And then also yeah. just prioritizing and only focusing on the next most important thing. Yeah, yeah. that's a much more concise way of putting it. <laughs> no, no, but I, I was just listening and, and trying to understand because I think that there is a lot of, whether it's recession, whether it's COVID, whether it's, you know, financial crisis that happened in, you know, 2007, 8, 9, um, regardless. And, you know, we talked to so many different pros on here who have been through different life cycles. As we think about any upcoming economic or political life cycles or whatever, it's kind of scary, like if you think about all of it at once, but I love, I think that's a, a really beautiful way of, of handling that stress. And so that's, that's a cool thing. Like I hope, I hope people can, can hear that and kind of learn from that. Um, let's go back really quick and talk about the permitting process. Um, Tiffin, it's with two Fs, correct? Yeah, Tiffin. Okay, they in, in that area. Do they? Or is it um, heavily permitted area? Do you have to, you know, pull a lot of permits for buildings and things like that? Or is it a little bit more lenient? What's the What's the climate there? Yeah, so um, we are not actually in the city of Tiffin. We're um, rural, and we are agriculturally zoned. So um, we we fall under the agritourism rule in Ohio. Um, I know agritourism laws change from state to state. Um, so we did, we did have to um, make sure we were up to fire code and um, we had to change the use of the barn, not the use of the property, just the use of the barn. Um, but other than that, we did have to go to our, our township and get a letter like certifying that we were agritourism, but um, we didn't have to work through some of like the commercial permitting process that um, like venues in like the big city or like a new build would have to go through. Um, so it, it was a little bit different and I know agritourism changes from state to state, but um, yeah. It, gonna, it does vary a lot. I was going to ask, what made you qualify for agrotourism? Like for anyone listening who's not familiar with that term, what what does that all entail? So um, agrotourism here in Ohio, and again, it changes from state to state. Not every state has a law about this. But in Ohio, if you are, um, and I, I can't remember the exact specifics, but I'm pretty sure if you are on an agriculturally zoned property over, I think, 10 acres, that is actively farming and engaging in an agricultural enterprise. Um, we actually sit on 120 acres. We grow corn, soybeans, wheat, pumpkins, um, and we use the barn for agricultural purposes when it's not being used for weddings. So um, we do store pumpkins and different equipment in there. Um, so because of that, um, we are still considered an, an agricultural use. and um, it the the law itself provides us certain protections and allows us to get insurance whereas you know otherwise insurance companies wouldn't touch a farm um let alone a farm that's having an event with alcohol um just because you know the liability there is just so huge um so we have to we have to have signage and and different things to um to, to show the law. Um, we actually have a sign that like references the Ohio revised code and different things um, talking about liability that we have to have displayed at all times. But um, it's really helped a lot of um, like pumpkin farms and wedding venues here in Ohio in um, ways that otherwise they probably wouldn't be able to be open. I love that. That is, that's really cool because it's, I see it as a second stream of income, right? Yeah. for mm -hmm. for the farm like you said saving the barn was kind of that initial push do you how do you have any involvement in kind of the farming side of the property um uh, i'm manual labor and dinner crew <laughs> um so <laughs> I'll, yeah i i i'll bring dinner to the fields for my husband or i'll pick pumpkins but on the day-to-day -day, that's not really my area of expertise um 
but but going back to what you said, like the agritourism law, like it really allows um, farmers to div diversify their income. Um, the, the wedding industry is hard. Every industry is hard. Uh, farming is a hard one to be in. And, um, you know, you're always looking to diversify so you can continue that family legacy. Totally. Okay, so I have another question about agro-tourism for you and, and your farm there, um, and then how that kind of goes along with the weddings, because I think I was actually born in Texas. You know, yeah. we had a, a small farm, I think more of a ranch, actually. We had, you know, horses, goats, chickens, all, all the animals. Uh, and then moving here to California, and in the subdivision that we moved into, is just a total, like, culture shock. <laughs> difference of lifestyle, right? Yeah. And I think it's really cool. You mentioned legacy. You're talking about, you know, the impact of the farm. How important do you think um, farming is? And then being able to expose people, guests of the wedding, to kind of a bit of the farm element who maybe are not familiar with that, who are coming from a bigger city to attend someone's wedding there. Yeah. So I, it's one of my favorite things about having weddings at the barn. Um, we, you know, we're out and about talking to guests, um, throughout the evening. And a lot of times people will kind of corner my husband or I and start asking us questions about the barn or the farm. Cause, um, I mean, the barn does have like really beautiful hand, um, hewn beams. And, um, then we get asked all the time about the farm and the operation and the family. And, um, it, it's been so much fun because, um, you briefly mentioned that there is such a disconnect today between consumers um, knowing where their food comes from and um, having a relationship with a farmer. You know, uh, historically, so many people grew up on farms, but today that's that's changed. Most people don't know where their food comes from. So being able to bring people on the farm and um, show them like, you know, we're normal people just like them and um, kind of give them a taste of of what we do is just really special and fun. And it's honestly uh, one of my favorite parts of being able to bring people on property. That's that's so cool. That's really inspiring, I think. And for a lot of people, maybe folks who are listening or watching right now who have a dream of owning a venue one day, that idea of getting kind of reconnected to what is very important, what is the reality of like where our food comes from and where our, like <laughs> you were saying this and I couldn't help but, but laugh a little bit. We had this neighbor when we moved between homes and we were kind of moving from a smaller property to a bigger property. This lady moved from the city and she legitimately didn't know. She thought milk was somehow like processed and I think she conceptually maybe knew that it came from a cow at some point, but she didn't yeah. really connect the dots. And so we milked <laughs> our cows and goats and we gave her some milk one day and she was like, like, what is this? Like this, did this come from the store? And we're like, no, it comes from a cow. And she's like, no, like she was actually like in <laughs> shock that, that how did this happen? Like, I thought it was some sort of scientific process. It was like, oh no, but um, that's, yeah, everyone has their own realm of expertise, right? Very true, very true. Um, okay, so so you're through the permitting process, doing construction. Can you tell me from the time that you, maybe early 2019 when you started wanting to do the construction, when you wanted mm -hmm. to um, you know, refinish the barn and make it more uh, available for weddings and events, how long did that process take you from when it was there to like where you are now are you are you kind of more or less done with construction or are there still projects you're working on so funny story um i i would say we weren't done with the first phase of construction until um end of april 2021 um and and that's just because um after wedding season our wedding season is from may to october just because um the weather here in ohio we don't have heat in the main part of the barn so um we're, we are seasonal. And um, so then during the winter, we kind of worked on finishing up some of the the projects that didn't get finished during that first 2020 wedding season. So I, you know, I, I wouldn't say we were done with construction until that spring of 2021. Um, but then last, last January, so January of 2022, um, my sister got engaged. And she was like, I want to get married at the barn and invite, you know, 350 people. 
And our capacity at the time was for 180. And uh, so we had plans for expansion um, and we, but it had been like the three to five year plan. We were like, we are so done with construction. Like we need a break. Um, and then my sister gets engaged and um, she got engaged in end of January of 2022, decided to get married in August of 2022. And um, so we spent the remainder of uh, the, the, time, the time between January and August um, working our, our tails off to get uh, the expansion done for my sister. So we got it done just in time. Um, and actually, I'm so happy we did it because it's really changed the game for us. Um, we now have, now have an entirely separate space. So we have two under roof um, spaces in the barn, which is incredible for rain plants around here. Um, and then uh, it increased our capacity to 250, which is um, pretty important around here just because there are a lot of Weddings in Northwest Ohio are generally 250 to 300 people. So um, it helps uh, us compete a little bit better in the marketplace. Mm, that makes sense. When you were going about adding those things, an extra space, more capacity, was that stuff that you had to also get permits or signed off for? Or was it just kind of like extra defined space that you were able to pretty easily convert? Yeah, so the space that we uh, convert or added on, I guess, was already part of the barn. It was just um, not pretty <laughs> and it was not clean. So um, primarily the biggest thing that we've had to work through is fire code. Mm -hmm. And we did end up having to put in fire suppression. So we're probably like the safest, um, you know, 100 plus year old barn you'll ever be in because we do have fire suppression so that's amazing and i've heard the systems are pretty expensive and maybe complex to put in is that correct uh they're very expensive we actually um we found a company out of washington so we had initially been told that we had to put in a sprinkler system and they wanted to basically put in like a silo so that we'd have water pressure and cause we're not on city water. And um, it was gonna be a quarter million plus just to put in the sprinkler system. And um, my husband ended up finding this company out of Washington. It's what they, they are basically giant fire extinguishers. They're about the size of like a propane tank that you'd put on a grill. And, um, they're like custom color powder coated to match the ceiling of the barn and they, they hang and it's like a one-time use powder, dry powder system. Um, and our, our fire chief approved it. But since then, we've actually been able to help other venues that have had to do the same thing because it's substantially cheaper than a water system. Um, and it, it meets fire code, at least here in Ohio. So um yeah, that, that's incredible. That is, I think you're going to be, a lot of people are probably going to be like, wait, what is that? Like, we're going to have to make sure we put your links at the end of the show so people can uh, yeah. message you about that. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk operations, marketing, sales, kind of like what you're, what you're doing now. Um, we talked about the website just kind of uh, very briefly before we got on here. You built the website yourself, correct? Yeah, I did. That is incredible, and it's it's a beautiful website. You know, we'll have uh, links to all that in the description, uh, and all the show notes and all of that. But I was wondering, was there anyone as you were creating the website, or even creating some of the um, documents you use, contracts, things like that? Was there anyone in the wedding and events industry who kind of inspired you, or was a little bit of a guiding light for you as far as figuring out some of these things when you hadn't done it before? Yeah. So um, initially when we, like our very first year, I, um, you know, I, I followed everyone that had a barn that I'd ever seen on social media. Um, and actually, as we were working through some of the fire suppression things, um, I reached out to a bunch of them. And um, so I, I would say I kind of found a couple mentors here locally in Ohio. Um, and so they kind of helped me. Um, but then I also in 2021, I did, I went through Kristen Benford's venue accelerator. And I will say that since I did that, it, um, it, it helped substantially. 
So. That's so cool. I love hearing that. I'm, we're going to have to clip this up and send it to her because I know um, she's she's a dear friend and it's it's always cool to hear when people have gone through her program or any of the other people you know that we've we've had on the show. But that's that's really yeah. good. I love that. Talk me through your operations and your marketing. Let's start with marketing first. I know you said initially you looked at Wedding Wire in the Knot and you, know, you said before you knew it, you had 20 uh, weddings booked. Did you start with them? Are you still using them? What's your take on using them as a marketing source? Yeah, so um, again, I, I do think I was really, really naive when we first started in terms of marketing. Um, we just, I, I didn't even realize you had to pay for the knot when we first started. I just kind of reached out to them and I got a call and then they're like, oh, it's this much a month. And I was like, oh, um, <laughs> let me talk to my, my husband. Um, and it was really when we signed that contract with the knot that we were like, I guess we're really doing this um, because they do make you sign that your contract um, from the get go. And so we were like, well, I guess we're, you know, we really need to book some weddings now. Yeah. Um, and so most of our leads that first year um, came from the knot. We were not on wedding wire at the time. Um, we also had Facebook and Instagram, but we weren't really utilizing them well at all at the beginning. Um, and then since then, we have free listings on everything that'll give me a free listing. But um, we do do some Facebook ads and Google ads. We're on um, Wedding Wire as well. Um, I have mixed feelings on the Not in Wedding Wire now that um, we're a couple years into it, but. Um, I'm not quite ready to pull the plug. I know there's a lot of chatter in the industry on um, whether or not they're worthwhile, but um, for us at the beginning, they absolutely were. And um, now that we're more established, I do see more coming from Google. Um, but again, I'm not quite ready to pull the plug yet. Totally. I was going to ask, what do you feel, have you seen where your leads come from shift from when you first started your venue to now where you're a couple years in? Yeah. So our website at the beginning was so bad. <laughs> um, I was so proud of it, but um, it's really come such a long way. Um, and what actually, once I really invested time into getting our website, um, you know, helpful and really pretty, um, that's when I really started seeing more of a shift to Google. Um I think my, I didn't know a whole lot about SEO at the beginning, but um, we have invested in that as well. So I think, you know, as I've improved everything, it just has kind of come along. Um, and, and word of mouth has helped too. Now we're starting to hear a lot of like, oh, I was at a wedding here or, oh, I was, you know, my friend's getting married here and she said you should check it out. So I'm getting a lot more client referrals than I ever had before. Um but it's definitely shifted. That's cool to hear. And I think, I don't know, one of the things that has been part of our experience running the venues that we, that we run here in California has been, you know, we started a lot of them on Wedding Wire in the Knot just because they were brand new projects, most of them. And then mm -hmm. as the projects have matured now and we're a couple years in, it just has made sense now that the leads have started to diversify and go on, you know, yeah. we've seen them come from different platforms now. Certainly Google is extremely helpful and, you know, quite a few of our leads come from Google, organic search, things like that, social media for sure. Mm -hmm. What about social media? Are you using social media to promote your venue? Yes. Um, we are on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on TikTok um, and Pinterest. Um, I, I've been trying Reels and TikTok. Um, I don't know that I'm seeing a whole lot of, of uh, inquiries coming out of it, but you know, I think sometimes it takes a while, right? Like it could be, you know, someone that's not even engaged yet is seeing the reel or the TikTok and, you know, maybe they'll remember it in a year. Um, I don't see any harm in doing it. It's kind of fun. It's a nice creative outlet. Do you see any similarities between farming and what you do there on the family farm and what you're doing with venues and kind of how maybe it just takes a little bit of time investing into the marketing before you actually reap the benefits of it? Uh, yeah. And actually there's all kinds of people that are much more like 
agriculturally focused than, than I am. Like I've been on my husband and like, you need to start like a uh, social media for our farm. And, you know, we should do some YouTube videos or different things to educate people. But um, just like in the wedding industry, there are people in the agricultural industry doing those exact same things and using the marketing tools to um, spread awareness and c- communicate about what they're doing on their farms. And um, because we're, we're wedding focused, that's kind of where I've put my energy. But um I need to do better because we do pumpkin. We grow pumpkins and we offer them to our brides. Like our brides can decorate and use pumpkins however they want free of charge for their weddings. As long as we can sell them afterwards, they can use whatever they want. So it's a huge benefit for them. And we grow the cool ones, like the kind you get at Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and stuff. So um, I need to spend a little bit more time in our Arlington Acres space talking about the farm. It's not something I've been great at, but um, I need to do more of that. Well, speaking of which, how do you, how do you do everything? I mean, you're, you're building the website, you're doing, you're doing the tours. Is that correct? I do. Yeah. The tours, um, are, is there anything on your venue right now that you are not doing? Um, I don't think so. No, that's incredible. If there was something that you would outsource or have, you know, an employee that you would hire for, what would you let go of first? Uh, Cleaning and setup, definitely. And actually, I I should say, I did hire two ladies to help me last um, last fall to do some of the cleaning because I still work full time. So, um, and I was traveling a lot last year. So they would come in and do the um, setup for me because I just didn't have time. Um, But... Um, I don't think we're going to do that this year. I think it's going to be back to me, um, and my husband doing it all. And, um, and uh, family still helps. I should say that like our family's so incredible. I can just call one of them and be like, Hey, I need a babysitter so I can go set up for this wedding ceremony or, you know, whatever. Um, but be, there are some benefits because we do live on property, um, you know, in the evening, like once the kids are in bed, I'll just go out and I'll, you know, re set up the barn for whatever that weekend's wedding is, or I'll go clean the bathrooms, um, at like eight o'clock on a Tuesday night. Um, they're farmers are workaholics. I don't know if you know that, but, um, we don't stop. So, well, and it, it definitely is a testament to how much you can actually fit in, you know, like you're juggling kids, you're juggling, you mentioned another job. What do you do? What's your kind of other, other, you said full-time job, right? Uh, yes, right now. I I don't know when this will air, but, um, I am planning on quitting here in the next couple of weeks. So, um, I'm very excited to be able to focus on the kids in the barn and hopefully have a little bit more free time here coming up. But, um, so I actually do fundraising. So no way that, that is awesome. Yeah. Have you seen any any similarity in what you did with fundraising to what you're doing now? Like, have there been any skills that you've kind of cross applied from, from that industry and that world to what you're doing now? Um, I think a little bit of like the sales aspect and, um, marketing, but, um, I think doing both has made me better at each of them in different ways. Um, you know, the skills that I've learned from, um, booking weddings have helped me with fundraising and the skills that I had, like cold calling. Um, I'm a really, I'm great at cold calling now um, because I, I did fundraising. Um, so I have no problem, for, you know, calling a bride or um, talking through some like really hard things because um, I've asked people for money on the phone. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a learned skill. Totally. That's a great way to learn. You know, you put yourself in that environment. And um, Sarah, one of the things that I I love hearing is how the careers and the past experiences of venue owners have kind of shaped and made very specific to them their venues. You know, like you just mentioned some of the skills you have with cold calling. You have no problem, you know, following up with brides. Um, I've talked to other venue owners who maybe they have a design background. So their venue is very, you know, they've got all these design elements or maybe someone has a background in accounting. So they really, their yeah. books are really clean. And, and I love seeing that and hearing that because I think for anyone listening or, or watching this who, you know, dreams of owning a venue one day, it's not like you have to kind of like put that old career aside. 
whatever you're doing, whatever you were doing before, whatever your you know, history is in, you can very much apply that and have that be kind of like your special touch on your process, your venue, whatever. That's really neat. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me about your packages there. Let's get it into operations a little bit more. So what do people get when they book at Arlington Acres? Yeah, so um, we are just the venue and tables and chairs. So um, when they book with us, they get um, all day Saturday from nine until 11 o'clock. Um, it'll be set up for them when they arrive. And they we have, um, again, we have two spaces. We have the historic part of the barn, the new part of the barn that we just finished last year. We have this great big patio overlooking the fields. And then we have um, this really beautiful lawn with the silo next to the barn. So they can use all four of the spaces. If it's all inclusive, we, we're not really into add-ons or charging for use of different spaces. It's just as much work to have them in you know, one part of the barn as the other. So um, yeah, we have it all set up for them. I like that very, you know, simple, straightforward, transparent pricing. I think, I think couples nowadays really are looking for that regardless of where you're at in the country. Yeah. Is that common is like a blank canvas or more of a, I hate the word DIY, but like, or the phrase DIY, but like, is the blank canvas model that you're going off of pretty common in kind of the Tiffin area and, and just Ohio in general from your knowledge, or is it more all inclusive people doing catering bar, all of those things? I think it's a good mix. I will say, I, you know, I think people, the first thing that gets added is bar. Um, and so it's, you know, blank canvas plus bar. And, you know, maybe we'll move toward that model here in the future too. But um, it, there's a really good mix throughout Ohio of, of types of venues. Do you, you mentioned that you might add on a bar. From your understanding so far, is that a complicated process to add add that on and to be able to do the bar at your venue? Uh, I'm not sure. I honestly have not really looked into it. I just, we do require like licensed insured bartenders. And um, I found that our couples find that to be kind of cumbersome and challenging. So I think the only reason I would add on a bar is really to make that process easier for them. Um, just because I, I really do pride ourselves in making it easy for the couples. And um, again, that that seems to be kind of a, a pinch point. And so I, I'm kind of working through how to make that easier for them. But I don't know that I want to get a liquor license. So um, we'll see. Very cool. I, I love that you said pinch point. And I think just the way that I'm hearing you talk about this, it seems like you move from like one issue to the next, and you're thinking about it very analytically, right? You're thinking like, okay, where, what's causing friction in my business? What is the point that if I reduce friction, it'll be easier for people to book? Or, and, I, and I think that's such an amazing way of thinking about venue ownership because it can be very easy to get overwhelming, but if you just kind of, almost like you did through COVID, right? Like just look at the next most important thing. Where's the most next, most frictiony point, right? Mm -hmm. And get rid of that. You're gonna, you're gonna do well. You're gonna continue to do well. Yeah, I, I hope so. I, I try again. I try to make it easy for them, easy for me. If I can figure out what their problem is, it makes my life a lot easier too. So it's uh, beneficial for everybody. Can you help me understand how many weddings you did? You said you had 20 weddings going into 2020, um, mm -hmm. and then you had to reschedule five of them. So maybe you had yeah. 15 or so. How many weddings did you do in 2021 and 2022? Um, in 2021 and 2022, we did between 20 and 25 each year. Okay. Um, and then we are uh, right around 30 for this year, which sounds like a lot. I don't, I don't know how the people who do like 80 and 100 plus weddings, I don't know how you do it. Again, you, there's a reason you hire staff, right? Like I'm, I'm a a uh, one woman plus family team at the moment. So, um, and, and we won't always be like that, but for now that's what we're, where we're at. So. I love that handling what you can handle right now, doing well with it again, removing the friction and then adding on as you go forward to that end. Is that something that you dream about? You know, are you looking to add on and do 60, 80, a hundred weddings? Um, and maybe with the addition of staff, or do you really want to keep it more to like a 20 to 30, 30 to 40 
um, weddings per year type of venue? I want to do what we can do well. So if I find that, you know, 30 weddings this year is just way too much and I need to cut it back down to the 2025 range, then we absolutely will because we really want to serve our couples and do the best for them. Um, And, you know, you also hear about burnout a lot in the industry. And, you know, I don't want to burn out either because I love doing weddings and I love um, being with our couples and celebrating with them every weekend. But um, I do... It can see maybe in the next couple of years hiring some staff to help just because um, we have little kids right now. So we're kind of stuck on property as it is where it's not like we're going a lot of places. But as they get older, like, you know, I still want to be able to take our girls to the zoo or, you know, do fun things. So um, I do see us hiring staff in the future. But right now, um, we purposely have kind of kept the business lean just because um, we really want to, you know, pay our bills um, and pay them quickly so that we have more uh, more room in the future. Totally. Well, and you're building that foundation, you're building your reputation, you're building up the reviews, all of that stuff, and you're getting your, your system. And I got to say, I think there's a difference in the skills that it takes to run a venue at 50, 60, 70, 80 weddings per year plus, because you shift from like you're doing executing everything yourself where it just takes you being having kind of the grit and determination to either do it or figure it out to now managing people communication delegation you know what to hand off what to not how like management of people do you need to hire a manager because you don't love managing people or are you a great manager and you can hire a couple people right so it's like there's a lot more and the the roles and responsibilities and the the skills that it takes really do change once you start adding on a team so absolutely that that makes sense that you're doing it first doing what you can do well i really like that that's that's really cool well i've saved the uh an interesting question for last how did you think about pricing when you were thinking about your venue in the beginning and then has your viewpoint on pricing and how you charge for venue use changed over the years that you've owned the venue? Uh, quite drastically, <laughs> quite drastically. Um, so when we first started, we had just recently gotten married ourselves and um, we, we, since we had our own wedding on my family farm, we didn't pay for a venue. So we really had no idea what to charge. So um, we kind of looked around at what local venues were charging and they were only charging like $800 or $1,000 for like a blank canvas venue. You know, I'm looking at like the park and uh, different things. And um, so we started at $1,500 um, for the weekend. Oh. Um, I think that's why I think that's why we booked so many so quickly. That's um, amazing. But um yeah so then we kind of just slowly and start pricing up that first year as we were doing more construction and um then it was really when i went through the venue accelerator that uh gave me the confidence to um price more where the market was at it, it helped me identify more of what our real market was you know not comparing just the park down the street but you know looking at you know, venues an hour, hour two away from us that um, couples are looking at, you know, I, when we initially started, I really thought our market was just Tiffin. And what I found is we're a great middle ground for um, people from all over. So we've had couples from Detroit, um, like, you know, the groom was from Detroit and the bride was from Youngstown, which is like three hours east of us and um, we're the middle ground for them. So um, I, I found that we're kind of a destination a little bit um, just because we're a good middle ground for people. And then because we're, um, we're just a little bit more affordable than weddings, wedding venues in like the city. So people are willing to drive an hour, hour and a half out here to have a wedding just to save a little bit of money. Um, so th- just that knowledge, that, that market knowledge was just something I didn't have at the beginning and I should have done a better job at. Again, I was really naive. I've learned so much in the past couple of years. Um, so um, again, my thoughts on pricing have changed pretty drastically. We're now considered the expensive venue in Tiffin. 
So, and what does that mean? Because where, if you had a starting point of fifteen hundred for the weekend, where where are you at now? Just to kind of give some some contrast to that, maybe even some hope for someone who's you know needs that little push over the edge to maybe raise their prices as well. Yeah. So, I mean, we're still. I'm sure cheap compared to California, but um, we're right about five thousand dollars for a Saturday. Very cool, but that's a big jump going from fifteen hundred for wh- what two days? Was it like a for the weekend? Was it like we were giving experience? them the whole weekend? We Friday, gave them Saturday. like Friday evening to Sunday, and now it's five thousand just for Saturday, and then we book on Fridays and Sundays as well. How many price adjustments did you have in the past two years? Um, two or three. Okay, maybe four. And so was it kind of what, when did you know that you needed to adjust the pricing? Was it when people were not pushing back? How did you, what was kind of the litmus test that you used to know when you needed to change? I think it's just knowing your own value. Um, You know, we did a couple weddings and we were like, wow, this is so much work. Like we are not getting paid enough (laughs) for this much work. And, you know, um, and not only that, but then you start, you know, you have someone abuse the property or um, we had uh, some liquor issues at one of our weddings in 2020 or maybe 2021. And you, you know, you start thinking about that liability and like how they're abusing the property and the, just the scare of, you know, maybe having the EMS called and, you know, you start readjusting um, and targeting to your ideal client. Cause you know, you do kind of weed out a little bit of that when you are at a higher price point. Absolutely. It makes so much sense. And sometimes it's tough to do because there's that side of you that says, oh my gosh, we're worth more. That was really hard. Uh, We absolutely need to be making more. It's just not enough what we're charging. But then there's the side that's also like, but, you know, and you have that other little, you know, voice on your shoulder or whatever that's saying, you know, but, oh, that, that sounds so much more expensive. What was the biggest price jump that you made? Uh... I think in 2021, it was probably when I was going through the venue accelerator. I don't remember exactly. I think I raised it maybe 1500. Got it. Oh, that's a big I jump. Think jump. When I, yeah, it was, a, it was a big jump. Cool. Awesome. Well, Sarah, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk with you, to get to know Arlington Acres a little bit more. And um, I want to ask a question that actually I've forgotten the last couple episodes to ask, I, which I can't, I can't believe. But I want to know what's your favorite part about running your venue? And then what's your least favorite part about running your venue? And let's start with the least favorite so that we can end on a high note. For me, it's, I think it stems back to because we live on property. Mm-hmm. Um, we get random people just show up like while we're, you know, eating dinner and they'll like come up to the house and be like, Hey, um, is this where the, the wedding is this weekend? Um, but and, you know, they just, oh, no. they think they can just, you know, come say hello, <laughs> um, you know, on a Tuesday night when we're eating dinner. Um, so it's just the random people showing up and, you know, we're a small town, so, you know, they're all, it's generally like grandma and grandpa's just scoping it out because they want to know where they're going. But, um, you know, we do try to compartmentalize a little bit and, you know, take our time when we can. And, um, so I wish we could put a gate up or something, but we can't cause it's farm equipment. So mm-hmm. anyways, um, it's, it's not a big problem. It's not a terrible problem, but Totally. Well, it makes sense. And even with some of the properties that we manage here, we, it is funny, you know, you'll have people that just decide to like pop by and see the venue. And, you know, yeah. if you're, if your sales person isn't there, you know, if you're not there personally, and then they're like, Hey, we're here. They call the number. Hey, we're here. We wanted to see the property. And it's like, we're not there. Like, do you, did you set an appointment? Yeah. Did we miss something? And then it's like, no, we just were in the area and we were swinging by. So definitely there is, and I mean, that'll happen. We have by appointment only. I mean, we do make it pretty clear that, yeah. that that's how it is, but I can only imagine living on property. You don't have the, it's not like you're not there. You are there and they'll, they'll come, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. they'll, they'll introduce yeah, you. I've been, you know, like, you know, you just answered the door like a normal person. Like if someone knocked, at your door and um you know you're in sweatpants and you just got out of the shower or something and they're like oh we were here for a barn tour and like 
Uh, <laughs> oh no. Oh man. So it is what it is, but very cool. Well, what is the best part about owning a venue? I think I touched on it earlier, but um, we really just love sharing the history of the barn and the farm and um, sharing what we can about agriculture and our farm and what we do with people just because um, not everyone has the ability to meet their local farmer. And so we like being able to do that for people and um, sharing the beauty of the property with them. It's just really special. I said I had one last question, and I want to ask you a bonus question about the farm a little okay. bit more. What yeah. do you, so you mentioned um, corn, you mentioned, could you kind of list off again some of the things that you grow there at the farm, and then how do you distribute it? Like, is it, do you sell it direct to different stores? Is there some distribution process? Could you give me a little bit of information about that? Yeah, so we grow corn. Uh, which is field corn. It's not uh, sweet corn that you would buy at the grocery store. So it's primarily used for animal feed. Um, we grow corn, soybeans, wheat, and pumpkins. Um, so the corn and soybeans are primarily used for feed. And then um, we, we actually have a flour mill here um, within like a half an hour. So it'll go there. Um, and then we actually just have a roadside stand for our pumpkins. And um, we are, my husband actually generally sells most of our, like the corn, soybeans, and wheat directly to um, the mills. Um, so it'll go straight from the field to the mill. But some farmers have great big grain bins. And so they'll be able to store and then they can sell at different times of year when they can get better prices. But um we're kind of a small farm, so um, we don't have that grain storage that other farms do. I was going to ask, what what determines what you grow? Like, why soybeans? Why corn? Why some of those things? Was it price driven, or just like what's the what the land is capable of growing? How do you go through that process? Yeah, so here in Northwest Ohio, that most people grow corn and soybeans and wheat just because that's um, what grows well here. But within like about half an hour, 20 minutes, actually just on the other side of the county, there's really, really great fertile soil for vegetables. So um, there is a fair bit of vegetable farming in near us, but the land that we have is not good for vegetables. So we don't we don't grow vegetables other than our pumpkins. Totally. So. You grow what you can, what the ground will give you. I love that. Yep. Yep. All right. Very cool. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show today. If someone wants to connect with you, they want to ask maybe about agro-tourism or those uh, fire suppression <laughs> systems that we talked about, where where's a good place to reach out to you? Uh, you can reach out to me on any of our social media, but I am best with email. Okay. And that's on our website and our social media as well. So. Totally. For anyone who's just on audio right now, could, do you mind saying that out so they can they can have that? Yeah, it's arlingtonacresoh at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, Sarah, thank you so much again for coming on the show. This was really, really fun. And uh, I'm excited for everyone to hear the show. It's, it's going to be uh, definitely helpful for everyone. And, and I appreciate you taking the time today. Yeah, thanks for having me.